Well, let's speak to Professor Robin Shattuck, who is the leading the trial of coronavirus vaccine at Imperial College London, where he's head of mucosal infection and immunity. Very good of you to uh, join us today. Do you think with this um, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine, should there have been a warning immediately that anybody with serious allergic reactions shouldn't be taking this? And I just say that while saying that it's, it's good to hear that both of these people are re have recovered already. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to keep this, you know, in, in proportion. It, it wasn't seen in a much larger trial. Um, and the regulators moved extremely quickly within 24 hours of identifying it. They were providing advice. And I think this shows that we've got a very good monitoring system that can pick up this, these types of, of rare events. And they're being super cautious. Is, and the larger the, the trial that you talk about, is that because people who put themselves forward for a trial, arguably, if they feel that they could potentially have a reaction, they wouldn't put themselves forward for it? So the n numbers would potentially be skewed? It's possible that it's skewed in that way, that, that you know, people may be less likely to come forward if they have a background of severe allergic responses to medicines. Um, and so it may not have been identified before. But remember, this is easy to manage. Um, and it's seen very acutely after vaccination. So it's not something that happens, you know, weeks after someone's left the vaccination center. And that's why the new advice is that people, you know, will stay for 15 minutes after their vaccination just to be on the safe side. And just explain to us, because it wasn't a serious, it wasn't a serious reaction just to make people feel a little bit uh, uh, less anxious, perhaps. Well, I don't have the exact details of the, the symptoms that these subjects suffered from, but it would be typically, you know, perhaps a rash, shortness of breath, possibly a, a drop in blood pressure, but not something that would end up hospitalizing you. Um, obviously, one can't be complacent. This is a new medicine, and you often see some of these things occurring early on. Um, you know, there were lots of small concerns and bumps in the road when the papillomavirus vaccine was first introduced. So it's not unexpected. Um, and it's the kind of thing that, that the regulators and, and the, the uh, processes for monitoring new medicines are very used to looking out for. And I guess uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca, the next vaccine that we're really keeping our eye on, they'll also be looking at this. Do you think that will uh, play very much on their minds when that particular vaccine is then rolled out? Well, you know, this is very standard practice for new vaccines. We don't know that the same thing will happen with the Oxford vaccine. Uh, it's quite likely there won't, or there might be some other uh, subgroup that doesn't tolerate the vaccine so well. And, and that's another reason why it's good, and we hope that more and more vaccines will get through, because we may find that for particular subgroups, um, certain vaccines are better than others. And so having that kind of uh, plurality of, of approaches means that we can use the vaccines more intuitively where there are potential risks. And when you talk about uh, vaccines being used for various people, a lot of people will look at the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine say, and look at it and say it's got 62 percent efficacy. Uh, what is, is there what makes them when it comes to saying to somebody that's that's still OK to take that vaccine? It's still as good or is it? Because when you hear the percentage comparable to the other ones, it doesn't seem that high. If you know. Yeah, I can see it's very confusing and difficult because they, they seem like very clear differences in terms of numbers. But the, those numbers are based on different definitions of whether the vaccine caused mild disease, severe disease. So they didn't measure exactly the same thing. I think the important aspect is both of these vaccines prevented people ending up being really sick and ending up in hospital. Um, and so they were very effective against serious disease. And one needs to remember that the flu vaccine is between 40 and 60 percent, uh, 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 has 40 to 60 percent efficacy. And that still has a massive impact on uh, health and the ability of the health, national health system to function during the influenza season. So anything above 60 percent is way better than the flu vaccine that we already have. So it, it's really important, really useful um, and much better than we in initially anticipated when we were starting to develop vaccines uh, in the early phase. Professor Robin Shattuck from Imperial College London, thank you so much for talking us through that. Uh, really good to get that clarity. Thank you.